Part 1, Chapter 3 of A Raw Youth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon. A Raw Youth by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. Part 1, Chapter 3. Indeed, there was no need. A higher consideration swallowed up all petty feelings, and one powerful emotion made up to me for everything. I went out in a sort of ecstasy. As I stepped into the street, I was ready to sing aloud. To match my mood, it was an exquisite morning. Sunshine, people out walking, noise, movement, joyousness, and crowds. Why, had not that woman insulted me? From whom would I have endured that look and that insolent smile without instant protest, however stupid it might be? I did not mind about that. Note that she had come expressly to insult me as soon as she could, although she had never seen me. In her eyes, I was an envoy from Versalov, and she was convinced at that time, and for long afterwards, that Versalov held her fate in his hands and could ruin her at once if he wanted to by means of a certain document. She suspected that, anyway. It was a duel to the death, and yet I was not offended. It was an insult, but I did not feel it. How should I? I was positively glad of it. Though I had come here to hate her, I felt I was beginning to love her. I don't know whether the spider perhaps does not hate the fly he has marked in his snaring. Dear little fly. It seems to me that the victim is loved, or at least may be loved. Here I love my enemy. I am delighted, for instance, that she is so beautiful. I am delighted, madame, that you are so haughty and majestic. If you were meeker, it would not be so delightful. You have spat on me, and I am triumphant. If you were literally to spit in my face, I should really not be angry, because you are my victim, mine and not his. How fascinating was that idea. Yes, the secret consciousness of power is more insupportably delightful than open domination. If I were a millionaire, I believe I should take pleasure in going about in the oldest clothes and being taken for a destitute man, almost a beggar being jostled and despised. The consciousness of the truth would be enough for me. That is how I should interpret my thoughts and happiness and much of what I was feeling that day. I will only add that in what I have just written, there is too much levity. In reality, my feeling was deeper and more modest. Perhaps even now I am more modest in myself than in my words and deeds. God grant it may be so. Perhaps I have done amiss in sitting down to write at all. Infinitely more remains hidden within than comes out in words. Your thought, even if it is an evil one, is always deeper while it is in your mind. It becomes more absurd and dishonorable when it is put into words. Verslav once said to me that the opposite was true only with horrid people. They simply tell lies. It is easy for them. But I am trying to write the whole truth, and that's fearfully difficult. Two. On that 19th of September, I took one other step. For the first time since I arrived, I had money in my pocket. For the 60 rubles I had saved up in two years, I had given to my mother, as I mentioned before. But a few days before, I had determined that on the day I received my salary, I would make an experiment of which I had long been dreaming. The day before, I had cut out of the paper an address. It was an advertisement that on the 19th of September at 12 o'clock in the morning in such and such a street at number so-and-so, there would be a sale by the local police authority of the effects that Mademoiselle Lebrecht and that catalog, the valuation, and property for sale could be inspected on the day of the auction, and so on. It was just past one. I hurried to the address on foot. I had not taken a cab for more than two years. I had taken a vow not to, or I should never have saved up my 60 rubles. I had never been to an auction. I had never allowed myself this indulgence. And though my present step was only an experiment, yet I had made up my mind not to take even that step till I had left grammar school, when I should break off with everything, hide myself in my shell, and become perfectly free. It is true that I was far from being in my shell and far from being free yet, but then I was only taking this step by way of an experiment, simply to look into it as it were to indulge a fancy, and after that not to recur to it perhaps for a long while, till the time of beginning seriously. For everyone else, this was only a stupid little auction, but for me it was the first plank in the ship in which Columbus would set out to discover his America. That was my feeling then.
When I arrived, I went into the furthest corner of the yard of the house mentioned in the advertisement and entered Mademoiselle Lebrecht's flat, which consisted of an entry and four small, low-pitched rooms. In the first room, there was a crowd of about 30 persons, half of them people who had come to bargain, while the rest, judging from their appearance, were either inquisitive outsiders or connoisseurs or representatives of Mademoiselle Lebrecht. There were merchants and Jews gloating over the objects made of gold and a few people of the well-dressed class. The very faces of some of these gentlemen remained stamped in my memory. In the doorway leading to the room on the right, there was placed a table so that it was impossible to pass. On it lay the things catalogued for sale. There was another room on the left, but the door into it was closed, though it was continually being opened a little way, and someone could be seen peeping through the crack, no doubt someone of the numerous family of Mademoiselle Lebrecht, who must have been feeling very much ashamed at the time. At the table between the doors facing the public sat the warrant officer, to judge by his badge, presiding over the sale. I found the auction half over. I squeezed my way up to the table as soon as I went in. Some bronze candlesticks were being sold. I began looking at the things. I looked at the things and wondered what I could buy and what I could do with bronze candlesticks and whether my object would be attained and how the thing would be done and whether my project would be successful and whether my project were not childish. All this I wondered as I waited. It was like the sensation one has at the gambling table at the moment before one has put down a card, though one has come to do so feeling... If I like, I'll put it down. If I don't, I'll go away. I'm free to choose. One's heart does not begin to throb at that point, but there is a faint thrill and flutter in it, a sensation not without charm. But indecision soon begins to weigh painfully upon one. One's eyes grow dizzy. One stretches out one's hand, picks up a card, but mechanically almost against one's will, as though someone else were directing one's hand. At last, one has decided and thrown down the card. Then the feeling is quite different. Immense. I'm not writing about the auction. I'm writing about myself. Who else would feel his heart throbbing at an auction? Some were excited. Some were waiting in silence. Some had bought things and were regretting it. I felt no sympathy with the gentleman who, misunderstanding what was said, bought an electroplated milk jug in mistake for a silver one for five rubles instead of two. In fact, it amused me very much. The warrant officer passed rapidly from one class of objects to another. After the candlesticks displayed earrings, after earrings an embroidered leather cushion, then a money box, probably for the sake of variety or to meet the wishes of the purchasers, I could not remain passive even for ten minutes. I went up to the cushion, and afterwards to the cash box. But at the critical moment my tongue failed me. These objects seemed to me quite out of the question. At last I saw an album in the warrant officer's hand. A family album in real Morocco, second hand with sketches in watercolor and crayon, in a carved ivory case with silver clasps, priced two rubles. I went up. It looked an elegant article, but the carving was damaged in one place. I was the only person who went up to look at it. All were silent. There was no bidding for it. I might have undone the clasps and taken the album out of the case to look at it, but I did not make use of my privilege and only waved a trembling hand as though to say, never mind. Two rubles, five kopecks, I said. I believed my teeth were chattering again. The album was knocked down to me. I at once took out the money, paid for it, snatched up the album, and went into a corner of the room. There I took it out of its case and began looking through it with feverish haste. It was the most trumpery thing possible. A little album with the size of a piece of notepaper with rubbed gilt edges exactly like the albums girls used to keep in former days when they left school. There were crayon and color sketches of temples on mountainsides, cupids, a lake with floating swans. There were verses. On a far journey I am starting... From Moscow I am departing, from my dear ones I am parting, and with post-horses flying south. They are enshrined in my memory. I made up my mind that I had made a mess of it. If there ever was anything no one could possibly want, it was this. Never mind, I decided. One's bound to lose the first card. It's a good omen, in fact. I felt thoroughly light-hearted. Ah! I'm too late. Is it yours? You have bought it? 
I suddenly heard beside me the voice of a well-dressed, presentable-looking gentleman in a blue coat. He had come in late. I am too late. Ah, what a pity. How much was it? Two rubles, five kopecks. Ah, what a pity. Would you give it up? Come outside, I whispered to him in a tremor. We went out on the staircase. I'll let you have it for ten rubles, I said, feeling a shiver run down my back. Ten rubles? Upon my word. As you like. He stared at me open-eyed. I was well-dressed, not in the least like a Jew or a second-hand dealer. Mercy on us. Why, it's a wretched old album. What use is it to anyone? The case isn't worth anything, certainly. You certainly won't sell it to anyone. I see you will buy it. Well, that's for a special reason. I only found out yesterday. I'm the only one who would. Upon my honor, what are you thinking about? I ought to have asked 25 rubles, but as there was, after all, a risk you might draw back, I only asked for 10 to make sure of it. I won't take a farthing less. I turned and walked away. Well, take four rubles, he said, overtaking me in the yard. Come, five. I strode on without speaking. Well, take it then. He took out ten rubles. I gave him the album. But you must own it's not honest. Two rubles and then ten, eh? Why not honest? It's a question of market. What do you mean by market? He grew angry. When there's a demand, one has a market. If you hadn't asked for it, I shouldn't have sold it for forty kopecks. Though I was serious and didn't burst out laughing, I was laughing inwardly, not from delight. I don't know why myself. I was almost breathless. Listen, I muttered, utterly unable to restrain myself, but speaking in a friendly way and speaking quite fond of him. Listen, when as a young man, the late James Rothschild, the Parisian one, who left 1,700 million francs, he nodded, heard of the murder of the Duc de Berry some hours before anybody else, he sent the news to the proper quarter, and by that one stroke, in an instant, made several millions. That's how people get on. So you're a Rothschild, are you? He cried as though indignant with me for being such a fool. I walked quickly out of the house. One step, and I had made seven rubles, 95 kopecks. It was a senseless step, a piece of child's play, I admit, but it chimed in with my theories, and I could not help being deeply stirred by it. But it is no good describing one's feelings. My ten rubles were in my waistcoat pocket. I thrust in two fingers to feel it, and walked along without taking my hand out. After walking a hundred yards along the street, I took the note out to look at it. I looked at it, and felt like kissing it. A carriage rumbled up to the steps of a house. The house porter opened the door, and a lady came out to get into the carriage. She was young, handsome, and wealthy-looking, gorgeously dressed in silk and velvet, with a train more than two yards long. Suddenly, a pretty portfolio dropped out of her hand and fell on the ground. She got into the carriage. The footman stooped down to pick the thing up, but I flew up quickly, picked it up, and handed it to the lady, taking off my hat. The hat was a silk one. I was suitably dressed for a young man. With a very pleasant smile, though with an air of reserve, the lady said to me, Merci, monsieur. The carriage rolled away. I kissed the ten-rouble note. Three. That same day I was to go and see Fim Zviev, one of my old schoolfellows at the grammar school who had gone to a special college in Petersburg. He's not worth describing, and I was not on particularly friendly terms with him, but I looked him up in Petersburg. He might, through various circumstances, which again are not worth relating, be able to give me the address of a man called Crafts, whom it was very important for me to see as soon as he returned from Vilna. Euphim was expecting him that day or the next, as he had let me know two days before. I had to go to the Petersburg side, but I did not feel tired. I found Euphim, who was also 19, in the yard of his aunt's house, where he was staying for the time. He had just had dinner and was walking about the yard on stilts. He told me at once that Kraft had arrived the day before and was staying at his old lodgings close by, and that he was anxious to see me as soon as possible, as he had something important to tell me. "'He's going off somewhere again,' added Euphim. As in the present circumstances, it was of great importance to see Kraft. I asked Euphim to take me round at once to his lodging, which it appeared was in a back street only a few steps away. But Euphim told me that he had met him an hour ago and that he was on his way to Durgachev's. 
But come along to Derga Chefs. Why do you always cry off? Are you afraid? Kraft might as a fact stay on at Derga Chefs, and in that case, where could I wait for him? I was not afraid of going to Derga Chefs, but I did not want to go to his house, though Euphemia had tried to get me there three times already and on each occasion had asked, Are you afraid? with a very nasty smile at my expense. It was not a case of fear, I must state at once. If I was afraid, it was of something quite different. This time I made up my mind to go. Dergachev's, too, was only a few steps away. On the way, I asked Dufim if he still meant to run away to America. Maybe I shall wait a bit, he answered with a faint smile. I was not particularly fond of him. In fact, I did not like him at all. He had fair hair and a full face of an excessive fairness, an almost unseemly childish fairness. Yet he was taller than I was, but he would never have been taken for more than seventeen. I had nothing to talk to him about. What's going on there? Is there always a crowd? I asked. But why are you always so frightened? He laughed again. Go to hell, I said, getting angry. There won't be a crowd at all. Only friends come and they're all his own set. Don't worry yourself. But what the devil is it to me whether they're his set or not? I'm not one of his set. How can they be sure of me? I am bringing you and that's enough. They've heard of you already. Kraft can answer for you too. I say, will Vasin be there? I don't know. If he is, give me a poke and point him out as soon as we go in. As soon as we go in, do you hear? I had heard a good deal about Vasin already and had long been interested in him. Dergachev lived in a little lodge in the courtyard of a wooden house belonging to a merchant's wife, but he occupied the whole of it. There were only three living rooms. All the four windows had the blinds drawn down. He was a mechanical engineer and did work in Petersburg. I had heard casually that he had got a good private berth in the provinces and that he was just going away to it. As soon as we stepped into the tiny entry, we heard voices. There seemed to be a heated argument, and someone shouted, Quae medicamente non senat, ferum senat, quae ferum non senat, ignis senat. I certainly was in some uneasiness. I was, of course, not accustomed to society of any kind. At school I had been on familiar terms with my schoolfellows, but I was scarcely friends with anyone. I made a little corner for myself and lived in it. But this was not what disturbed me. In any case, I vowed not to let myself be drawn into argument and to say nothing beyond what was necessary so that no one could draw any conclusions about me, above all, to avoid argument. In the room, which was really too small, there were seven men, counting the ladies, ten persons. Dergachev was five and twenty and was married. His wife had a sister and another female relation who lived with them. The room was furnished after a fashion, sufficiently though, and was even tidy. There was a lithographed portrait on the wall, but a very cheap one. In the corner there was an icon without a setting, but with a lamp burning before it. Dergachev came up to me, shook hands, and asked me to sit down. Sit down. They're all our own set here. You're very welcome, a rather nice-looking, modestly dressed young woman added immediately, and making me a slight bow, she at once went out of the room. This was his wife, and she too seemed to have been taking part in the discussion, and went away to nurse the baby. But there were two other ladies left in the room, one very short girl of about twenty, wearing a black dress, also rather nice-looking, and the other a thin, keen-eyed lady of thirty. They sat listening eagerly, but not taking part in the conversation. All the men were standing except Kraft, Vasin, and me. Yafim pointed them out to me at once, for I had never seen Kraft before either. I got up and went up to make their acquaintance. Kraft's face I shall never forget. There was no particular beauty about it, but a positive excess of mildness and delicacy, though personal dignity was conspicuous in everything about him. He was twenty-six, rather thin, above medium height, fair-haired, with an earnest but soft face. There was a peculiar gentleness about his whole personality, and yet if I were asked, I would not have changed my own, possibly very commonplace, countenance for his, which struck me as so attractive. There was something in his face I should not have cared to have in mine, too marked a calm in a moral sense, and something like a secret, unconscious pride. But I probably could not have actually formed this judgment at the time. It seems so to me now in the light of later events. I'm very glad you've come, said Kraft. 
I have a letter which concerns you. We'll stay here a little and then go home. Durgachev was a strong, broad-shouldered, dark-complexioned man of medium height with a big beard. His eyes showed acuteness, habitual reserve, and a certain incessant watchfulness. Though he was, for the most part, silent, he evidently controlled the conversation. Vasin's face did not impress me much, though I had heard of him as extraordinarily intelligent. He had fair hair, large, light, gray eyes, and a very open face, but at the same time there was something, as it were, too hard in it. One had a presentiment that he would not be communicative, but he looked undeniably clever, cleverer than Durgachev, of a more profound intellect, cleverer than anyone in the room, but perhaps I'm exaggerating. Of the other young men, I only recall two, one, a tall, dark man of 27 with black whiskers who talked a great deal, a teacher or something of the sort. The other was a fellow of my own age with good lines in his face, wearing a Russian tunic without sleeves. He was silent and listened attentively. He turned out afterwards to be a peasant. No, that's not the way to put it, the black-whiskered teacher began, obviously continuing the previous discussion. He talked more than anyone in the room. I'm not talking of mathematical proofs, but that idea which I am prepared to believe without mathematical proof. Wait a bit, Tehimorov, Durgachev interrupted loudly. The newcomers don't understand, you see? He suddenly addressed himself to me alone, and I confess, if he intended to put me as a novice through an examination, or to make me speak, it was adroitly done on his part. I felt it and prepared myself. It is all our friend Kraft, who is well known to us all for his character and the solidity of his convictions. From a very ordinary fact, he has deduced a very extraordinary conviction that has surprised us all. He has deduced that the Russians are a second-rate people. Third rate, shouted someone. A second-rate people destined to serve as the raw material for a nobler race, and not to play an independent part in the history of humanity. In view of this theory of his, which is perhaps correct, Kraft has come to the conclusion that the activity of every Russian must in the future be paralyzed by this idea, that all, so to speak, will fold their hands and... Excuse me, Durgachev, that's not the way to put it, Tehomorov interrupted impatiently again. Durgachev at once gave way. Considering that Kraft has made a serious study of the subject, has made on a physiological basis deductions which he regards as mathematically proved, and has spent perhaps two years on his idea, which I should be prepared a priori to accept with equanimity, considering all this, that is, considering Kraft's excitement and earnestness, the case must be considered as a phenomenon. All this leads up to a question which Kraft cannot understand, and that's what we must attend to. I mean, Kraft's not understanding it. For that's the phenomenon. We must decide whether this phenomenon belongs to the domain of pathology as a solitary instance, or whether it is an occurrence which may be normally repeated in others. That's what is of interest for the common cause. I believe Kraft about Russia, and I will even say that I am glad of it. Perhaps if his idea were assimilated by all, it would free many from patriotic prejudice and untie their hands. I am not influenced by patriotism said Kraft, speaking with a certain stiffness. All this debate seemed distasteful to him. Whether patriotism or not, we need not consider, observed Vassin, who had been very silent. But how, tell me, please, could Kraft's deduction weaken the impulse to the cause of humanity? shouted the teacher. He was the only one shouting. All the others spoke in a low voice. Let Russia be condemned to second-rateness, but we can still work and not for Russia alone. And what's more, how can Kraft be a patriot if he has ceased to believe in Russia? Besides being a German, a voice interrupted again. I am Russian, said Kraft. That's a question that has no direct bearing on the subject, observed Durgachev to the speaker who had interrupted. Take a wider view of your idea, cried Tomorov, heeding nothing. If Russia is the only material for nobler races, why shouldn't she serve as such material? It's a sufficiently attractive part for her to play. Why not accept the idea calmly, considering how it enlarges the task? Humanity is on the eve of its regeneration, which is already beginning. None but the blind deny the task before us. Let Russia alone if you've lost faith in her, and work for the future, for the future unknown people that will be formed of all humanity without distinction of race. Russia would perish sometime anyway. 
Even the most gifted peoples exist for 1,500 or at the most 2,000 years. Isn't it all the same whether it's 2,000 or 200? The Romans did not last 1,500 years as a vital force. They too have turned into material. They ceased to exist long ago, but they've left an idea, and it has become an element in the future of mankind. How can one tell a man there's nothing to be done? I can't conceive of a position in which there ever could be nothing to do. Work for humanity and don't trouble about the rest. There's so much to do that life isn't long enough if you look into it more closely. One must live in harmony with the laws of nature and truth, Mademoiselle Dergachev observed from the doorway. The door was slightly ajar, and one could see that she was standing there, listening eagerly with the baby at her breast, which was covered. Kraft listened with a faint smile and brought out at last with a somewhat harassed face, but with earnest sincerity... I don't understand how, if one is under the influence of some overmastering idea which completely dominates one's mind and one's heart, one can live for something else which is outside that idea. But if it is logically, mathematically proved to you that your deduction is erroneous, that your whole idea is erroneous, that you have not the slightest right to exclude yourself from working for the welfare of humanity simply because Russia is predestined to a second-rate part. If it is pointed out to you that in place of your narrow horizon, infinity lies open before you, that instead of your narrow idea of patriotism... Ah, Kraft waved his hand gently. I've told you there is no question of patriotism. There is evidently a misunderstanding, Basin interposed suddenly. The mistake arises from the fact that Kraft's conclusion is not a mere logical theory, but so to say a theory that has been transmuted into a feeling. All natures are not alike. In some men, a logical deduction is sometimes transmuted into a very powerful emotion, which takes possession of the whole being and is sometimes very difficult to dislodge or alter. To cure such a man, the feeling itself must be changed which is only possible by replacing it by another equally powerful one. That's always difficult and in many cases impossible. That's a mistake, roared the argumentative teacher. A logical proof of itself will dissipate prejudices. A rational conviction will give rise to feeling, too. Thought arises from feeling and dominating a man in its turn formulates new feeling. People are very different. Some change their feelings readily, while for others it's hard to do so, responded Vassin, as though disinclined to continue the argument, but I was delighted by his idea. That's perfectly true what you say, I said, turning to him, all at once breaking the ice and suddenly beginning to speak, that to change a feeling, one must replace it by another. Four years ago, a general in Moscow, I didn't know him, you see, but... Perhaps he couldn't have inspired respect of himself, and the fact itself may seem irrational, but, but he had lost a child. That's to say, two little girls who had died one after another of Scarlatina, and he was utterly crushed and did nothing but grieve, so that one couldn't bear to go and look at him, and he ended by dying scarcely six months later. It's a fact that he died of it. What could have saved him? The answer is a feeling of equal strength. One would have had to dig those two little girls out of the grave and give them back to him. That would have been the only thing. I mean, in that way, and he died. Yet one might have presented him with excellent reflections that life is transitory, that all are mortal. One might have produced statistics to show how many children do die of Scarlatina. He was on the retired list. I stopped out of breath and looked round. That's nothing to do with it, said someone. The instance you have quoted, though it's not quite in the same category, is very similar and illustrates the subject, said Vassin, turning to me. For, here I must confess why I was so delighted with what Vassin had said about the idea transmuted into feeling, and at the same time I must confess to a fiendish disgrace. Yes, I was afraid to go to Dergachev's, though not for the reason Yefim imagined. I dreaded going because I had been afraid of them even before I left Moscow. I knew that they, or some of their sort, it's all the same, were great in argument and would perhaps shatter my idea. I was firmly resolved in myself that I wouldn't give away my idea or say a word to them about it, but they, or again some of their sort, might easily say something to me which would destroy my faith in my idea, even though I might not utter a syllable about it. 
There were questions connected with my idea which I had not settled, but I did not want anyone to settle them but myself. For the last two years, I had even given up reading for fear of meeting with some passage opposed to my idea which might shake me. And all at once, Vasin had solved the difficulty and reassured me on the most essential point. After all, what was I afraid of and what could they do to me, whatever skill and argument they might have? I perhaps was the only one who understood what Vasin meant by an idea transformed into an emotion. It's not enough to refute a fine idea. One must replace it by something fine of equal strength. Or else, refusing absolutely to part with my feeling in my heart, I should refute the refutation, however strong the argument might be, whatever they might say. And what could they give me in place of it? And therefore I might be braver, I was bound to be more manly. While I was delighted with Vasin, I felt ashamed and felt myself an insignificant child. Then there followed fresh ignominy. It was not a contemptible desire to show off my intelligence that made me break the ice and speak. It was an impulse to throw myself on his neck. The impulse to throw myself on people's necks that they might think well of me and take me to their hearts or something of the sort. Pure beastliness, in fact. I look upon as the most abject of my weaknesses, and I suspected it in myself long ago. In fact, when I was in the corner in which I entrenched myself for so many years, Though I don't regret doing so, I knew I ought to behave in company with more austerity. What comforted me after every such ignominious scene was that my idea was as great a secret as ever, and that I hadn't given it away. With a sinking at my heart, I sometimes imagined that when I did let out my idea to someone, I should suddenly have nothing left, that I should become like everyone else, and perhaps I should give up the idea. And so I was on my guard and preserved it, and trembled at the thought of chattering, and now at Durgachev's, almost at the first contact with anyone, I broke down. I hadn't betrayed anything, of course, but I had chattered unpardonably. It was ignominious. It is a horrid thing to remember. No, I must not associate with people. I think so even now. Forty years hence I will speak. My idea demands a corner. 5. As soon as Vasin expressed approval, I felt irresistibly impelled to talk. I consider that everyone has a right to have his own feelings if they are from conviction, and that no one should reproach him with them. I went on addressing Basin, though I spoke boldly, it was as though I was not speaking, not my own tongue moving in my mouth. Really? The same voice which had interrupted Durgachev and shouted at Kraft that he was a German interposed with an ironical drawl. Regarding the speaker as a complete non-entity, I addressed the teacher as though he had called out to me. It's my conviction that I should not dare to judge anyone, I said, quivering and conscious that I was going to make a fool of myself. Why so mysterious? cried the voice of the non-entity again. Every man has his own idea, I went on, gazing persistently at the teacher, who for his part held his tongue and looked at me with a smile. Yours is, cried the non-entity, too long to describe, but part of my idea is that I should be left alone. As long as I have two rubles, I want to be independent of everyone. Don't excite yourself, I know the objection that will be made. And to do nothing, not even to work for that grand future of humanity which Mr. Kraft is invited to work for. Personal freedom, that is, my own, is the first thing, and I don't care about anything else. My mistake was that I lost my temper. In other words, you advocate the tranquility of the well-fed cow. So be it. Cows don't hurt anyone. I owe no one anything. I pay society in the form of taxes that I may not be robbed, killed, or assaulted, and no one dare demand anything more. I personally perhaps may have other ideas, and if I want to serve humanity, I shall, and perhaps ten times as much as those who preach about it. Only I want no one to dare to demand it of me, to force me to it, like Mr. Kraft. I must be perfectly free not to lift a finger if I like, but to rush and fall on everybody's neck from love to humanity and dissolve in tears of emotion is only a fashion. And why should I be bound to love my neighbor or your future humanity, which I shall never see, which will never know anything about me, and which will in its turn disappear and leave no trace? Time counts for nothing in this. When the earth in its turn will be changed into an iceberg and will fly off into the void with an infinite multitude of other similar icebergs, it's the most senseless thing one could possibly imagine. That's your teaching. Tell me why I'm bound to be so noble, especially if it all lasts only for a moment. Poo-poo, cried a voice. I had fired off all this with nervous exasperation. 
throwing off all restraint. I knew that I was making a fool of myself, but I hurried on, afraid of being interrupted. I felt that my words were pouring out like water through a sieve, incoherently, nineteen to the dozen, but I hurried on to convince them and get the better of them. It was a matter of such importance to me. I had been preparing for it for three years, but it was remarkable that they were all suddenly silent. They said absolutely nothing. Everyone was listening. I went on addressing my remarks to the teacher. That's just it. A very clever man has said that nothing is more difficult than to answer the question, why we must be honorable. You know, there are three sorts of scoundrels in the world. Naive scoundrels, that is, convinced that their villainy is the highest virtue. Scoundrels who are ashamed, that is, ashamed of their own villainy, though they fully intend to persevere with it. And lastly, simple scoundrels, purebred scoundrels. For example, I had a schoolfellow called Lambert who told me at 16 that when he came into his fortune, it would be his greatest satisfaction to feed on meat and bread while the children of the poor were dying of hunger. And when they had no fuel for their fires, he would buy up a whole wood stack, build it up in a field, and set fire to it there, and not give any of it to the poor. Those were his feelings. Tell me, what am I to say to a pure-blooded scoundrel like that if he asks me why he should be honorable? Especially now in these times which you have so transformed, for things have never been worse than they are now. Nothing is clear in our society. You deny God, you see. Deny heroism. What blind, deaf, dull-witted stagnation of mind can force me to act in one way if it's more to my advantage to do the opposite? You say a rational attitude to humanity is to your own advantage, too. But what if I think all these rational considerations irrational and dislike all these socialist barracks and phalanxes? What the devil do I care for them or for the future when I shall only live once on earth? Allow me to judge of my advantage for myself. It's more amusing. What does it matter to me what will happen in a thousand years to your humanity if, on your principles, I'm to get for it neither love nor future life nor recognition of my heroism? No, if that's how it is, I'd rather live in the most ignorant way for myself and let them all go to perdition. An excellent sentiment. Though I'm always ready to go with them. That's one better, the same voice again. The others still remained silent. They all scrutinized me, staring. But little by little, in different parts of the room, there rose a titter, subdued indeed, but they were all laughing at me to my face. Vasin and Kraft were the only ones not laughing. The gentleman with the black whiskers was sniggering too. He sneered at me persistently and listened. I'm not going to tell you my idea, I cried, quivering all over. Nothing would induce me. But I ask you, on the other hand, from your point of view, don't imagine I'm speaking for myself, for I dare say I love humanity a thousand times more than all of you put together. Tell me, and you must, you are bound now to answer because you are laughing. Tell me, what inducement do you hold out to me to follow you? Tell me, how do you prove to me that you'll make things better? How will you deal with my individual protest in your barracks? I have wanted to meet you, gentlemen, for ever so long. You will have barracks, communistic homes, strict nécessaire, atheism, and communistic wives without children. That's your ideal. I know all about it. And for all this, for this little part of mediocre advantage which your rational system guarantees me, for a bit of bread and a warm corner, you take away all my personal liberty. For instance, if my wife's carried off, are you going to take away my personal liberty so that I mayn't bash my rival's brains in? You tell me I shall be more sensible than myself. But what will the wife say to a husband so sensible if she has the slightest self-respect? Why, it's unnatural. You ought to be ashamed. You're a specialist on the woman question, then? The voice of the non-entity pronounced malignantly. For one instant, I had an impulse to fly at him and pummel him with my fists. He was a short fellow with red hair and freckles. Though what the devil does his appearance matter? Don't excite yourself. I've never once had relations with a woman. I rapped out for the first time addressing him directly. A priceless avowal which might have been made more politely in the presence of ladies. But there was a general movement among them. They were all looking for their hats and taking leave. Not on my account, of course, but simply because it was time to break up. But I was crushed with shame at the way they all ignored me. I jumped up, too. "'Allow me to ask your name. You kept looking at me,' said the teacher, coming up to me with a very nasty smile. 
Dolgoruki. Prince Dolgoruki? No, simply Dolgoruki. Legally the son of a former serf, Makar Dolgoruki, but the illegitimate son of my former master, Monsieur Versalov. Don't make a mistake, gentlemen. I don't tell you this to make you all fall upon my neck and begin howling like calves from sentimentality. There was a loud and unceremonious roar of laughter, so much so that the baby, who was asleep in the next room, waked up and began squealing. I trembled with fury. Everyone shook hands with Dergachev and went out without taking the slightest notice of me. Come along, said Kraft, touching me. I went up to Dergachev, pressed his hand, and shook it vigorously several times. You must excuse Kudrymov's being so rude to you. Kudrymov was the red-haired man, said Dergachev. I followed Kraft out. I was not in the least ashamed. 6. There is, of course, an immense difference between what I am now and what I was then. Still not in the least ashamed, I overtook Vasin on the stairs, leaving Kraft behind as of secondary importance, and with the most natural air as though nothing had happened, I asked, I believe you know my father, I mean, Versilov. He's not exactly an acquaintance of mine, Vasin answered at once, and without a trace of that insulting refinement of politeness which delicate people adopt when they speak to people who have just disgraced themselves. But I do know him a little. I have met him, and I have heard him talk. If you've heard him, no doubt you do know him, for you are you. What do you think of him? Forgive the abrupt question, but I need to know. It's what you would think. Just your opinion that I need. You're asking a great deal of me. I believe that man is capable of setting himself tremendous tasks and possibly carrying them through, but without rendering an account of his doings to anyone. That's true. That's very true. He's a very proud man. Is he a sincere man? Tell me, what do you think about his being a Catholic? But I forgot. Perhaps you don't know. If I had not been so excited, I should not, of course, have fired off such questions so irrelevantly at a man of whom I had heard but whom I had never seen before. I was surprised that Vasin did not seem to notice how rude I was. I heard something about it, but I don't know how far it may be true, he answered in the same calm and even tone as before. Not a bit. It's false. Do you suppose he can believe in God? He is a very proud man, as you said just now, and many very proud people like to believe in God, especially those who despise other people. Many strong natures seem to have a sort of natural craving to find some one or something to which they can do homage. Strong natures often find it very difficult to bear the burden of their strength. Do you know that must be awfully true? I cried again. Only I should like to understand. The reason is obvious. They turn to God to avoid doing homage to men, of course without recognizing how it comes about in them. To do homage to God is not so humiliating. They become the most fervent of believers, or to be more accurate, the most fervently desirous of believing. But they take this desire for belief itself. These are the people who most frequently become disillusioned in the end. As for Monsieur Versilov, I imagine that he has some extremely sincere characteristics, and altogether he interested me. Vasin, I cried, you rejoice my heart. It's not your intelligence I wonder at. I am astonished that you, a man of such a lofty nature and so far above me, can walk with me and talk to me as simply and courteously as though nothing had happened. Vasin smiled. You are too flattering, and all that has happened is that you have shown a weakness for abstract conversation. You have probably been through a long period of silence. For three years I have been silent. For three years I have been preparing to speak. You couldn't, of course, have thought me a fool. You're so extraordinarily clever though no one could have behaved more stupidly. But you must have thought me a scoundrel. A scoundrel? Yes, yeah, certainly. Tell me, don't you secretly despise me for saying I was Versilov's illegitimate son, boasting I was the son of a serf? You worry yourself too much. If you think you did wrong in saying so, you've only to avoid saying it again. You have fifty years before you. Oh, I know that I ought to be very silent with other people. This throwing oneself on people's necks is the lowest of all vices. I told them so just now, and here I am doing it to you. But there is a difference, isn't there? If you realize that difference, if you are capable of realizing it, then I bless this moment. Vasin smiled again. Come and see me if you care to, he said. I have work now and I'm busy, but I shall be pleased to see you. I thought from your face just now that you were too hard and uncommunicative. 
That may very well be true. I saw something of your sister, Lizaveta Makarovna, at Luga last year. Kraft has stopped, and I believe is waiting for you. He has to turn here. I pressed Vasin's hand warmly and ran up to Kraft, who had walked on ahead all the while I talked to Vasin. We walked in silence to his lodgings. I could not speak to him and did not want to. One of the strongest traits in Kraft's character was delicacy. End of chapter 3. Recording by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon. Part 1. Chapter 4 of A Raw Youth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon. A Raw Youth by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, Part 1, Chapter 4. 1. Kraft had been somewhere in the service and at the same time had been a paid assistant of Andronikov's in the management of the private business which the deceased gentleman had always carried on in addition to his official duties. What mattered to me was that from his close association with Andronikov, Kraft might well know a great deal of what interested me. But Marie Ivanovna, the wife of Nikolai Semyonovitch, with whom I had boarded so many years while I was at the grammar school in Moscow, was a favorite niece of Andronikov and was brought up by him, and from her I learned that Kraft had actually been commissioned to give me something. I had been expecting him for a whole month. He lived in a little flat of two rooms quite apart from the rest of the house, and at the moment, having only just returned, he had no servant. His trunk stood open, not yet unpacked, his belongings lay about on the chairs and were spread out on the table in front of the sofa, his traveling bag, his cash box, his revolver, and so on. As we went in, Kraft seemed lost in thought, as though he had altogether forgotten me. He had perhaps not noticed that I had not spoken to him on the way. He began looking for something at once, but happening to catch a glimpse of himself in the looking glass, he stood still for a full minute gazing at his own face. Though I noticed this peculiar action and recalled it all afterwards, I was depressed and disturbed. I was not feeling equal to concentrating my mind. For a moment I had a sudden impulse to go straight away and give it all up forever. And after all, what did all these things amount to in reality? Was it not simply an unnecessary worry I had taken upon myself? I sank into despair at the thought that I was wasting so much energy, perhaps on worthless trifles for mere sentimentality, while I had facing me a task that called for all my powers. And meanwhile, my incapacity for any real work was clearly obvious from what had happened at Dergachev's. Kraft, shall you go to them again? I asked him suddenly. He turned slowly to me as though hardly understanding me. I sat down on a chair. Forgive them, said Kraft suddenly. I fancied, of course, that this was a sneer, but looking attentively at him, I saw such a strange and even wonderful ingenuousness in his face that I positively wondered at his asking me so earnestly to forgive them. He brought up a chair and sat down beside me. I know that I am perhaps a medley of all sorts of vanities and nothing more, I began, but I'm not apologizing. And you've no need to apologize to anyone, he said quietly and earnestly. He talked all the time quietly and very slowly. I may be guilty in my own eyes. I like being guilty in my own eyes. Kraft, forgive me for talking nonsense. Tell me surely you don't belong to that circle. That's what I wanted to ask. They are no sillier than other people, and no wiser. They are mad like everyone else. Why is everyone mad? I asked, turning towards him with involuntary curiosity. All the best people are mad nowadays. It's the carnival of mediocrity and ineptitude and nothing else. But it's not worth talking about. As he talked, he looked away into the air and began sentences and broke off without finishing them. I was particularly struck by a note of despondency in his voice. Surely Vasin is not one of them. Vasin has a mind. Vasin has a moral idea, I cried. There are no moral ideas now. It suddenly appears that there is not one left, and what's worse, that there never have been any. Never have been any in the past? Let us leave that, he brought out with unmistakable weariness. I was touched by his sorrowful earnestness. Ashamed of my own egoism, I began to drop into his tone. The present day, he began after a pause lasting two minutes, looking away into space. The present day is the golden age of mediocrity and callousness, of a passion for ignorance, idleness, inefficiency, a craving for everything ready-made. No one thinks it's rare for anyone to work out an idea for himself. 
He broke off again and paused for a while. I listened. Nowadays they are stripping Russia of her forests and exhausting her natural wealth, turning the country into a waste and making it only fit for the Kalmuks. If a man looks forward and plants a tree, everyone laughs at him and tells him he won't live to enjoy it. On the other hand, those with aspirations discuss nothing but what will be in a thousand years. The idea that has sustained men has utterly gone. It's as though they were all at an hotel and were leaving Russia tomorrow. They are alive if they could only... Excuse me, Kraft. You said they worried their heads about what would happen in a thousand years, but you despair about the future of Russia. Isn't that an anxiety of the same sort? It... It's the most essential question in the world, he said irritably and jumped up quickly from his seat. Ah, yes, I forgot, he said suddenly in quite a different voice, looking at me in perplexity. I asked you to come for something special, and meanwhile, for heaven's sake, excuse me. He seemed suddenly to wake up from a sort of dream and was almost disconcerted. He took a letter out of a portfolio on the table and gave it to me. This is what I have to give you. It's a document of some importance, he began, speaking collectively and with a business-like air. Long afterwards, when I recalled it, I was struck by this faculty in him, at an hour such as this was for him, of turning such wholehearted attention on another person's affairs and going into them with such firmness and composure. It is a letter of Stolbiev's, that is, of the man whose will gave rise to Versilov's lawsuit with the Princess Sokolsky. The case is just being decided in the court and will certainly be decided in Versilov's favor. The law is on his side. Meanwhile, in this letter, a private letter written two years ago, the deceased sets forth his real dispositions, or more accurately, his desires, and expresses them rather in favor of the Sokolskys than of Versilov. At any rate, the points on which the Sokolskys rest their case in contesting the will are materially strengthened by this letter. Versilov's opponents would give a great deal for this letter, though it really has no positive legal value. Alexei Nikonorich Andronikov, who managed Versilov's affairs, kept this letter and not long before his death gave it to me, telling me to take care of it. Perhaps he had a presentiment that he was dying and was anxious about his papers. I was unwilling to judge of Alexei Nikonorich's intentions in the case, and I must confess that at his death I found myself in disagreeable uncertainty what to do with this document, especially as the case was so soon to be concluded. But Marie Ivanovna, in whom Alexei Nikonorich seems to have put great confidence in his lifetime, helped me out of the difficulty. She wrote to me three weeks ago, telling me that I was to give the letter to you, as this would, she believed her own expression, be in accordance with the wishes of the deceased, and I am very glad that I can at last give it to you. Tell me, I said, dumbfounded at this new and unexpected information, what am I to do with this letter now? How am I to act? That's for you to decide. Impossible. My hands are tied. You must admit that. Versilov is so reckoning on this fortune, and you know he'll be utterly lost without it, and it suddenly appears that a document like this exists. It only exists here in this room. Is that really so? I looked at him attentively. If you can't decide how to act in this case, what can I advise you? But I can't give it to the Sokolskys either. I should ruin all Versilov's hopes and be a traitor to him besides. On the other hand, if I give it to Versilov, I plunge the innocent into poverty, and I should put Versilov in a hopeless dilemma too. He would either have to give up the fortune or become a thief. You exaggerate the importance of the matter. Tell me one thing. Is this letter decisive, conclusive? No, it isn't. I'm not much of a lawyer. A lawyer on the other side would, no doubt, know how to make use of such a document and to turn it to account. But Alexei Nikonorich considered positively that if this letter were put forward, it would have no great legal value, so that Verisilov's case might be won all the same. This letter is more a matter of conscience, so to say. But that's what matters most of all, I interrupted, just because it would put Verisilov in a hopeless dilemma. He may, on the contrary, destroy the document and so escape all danger. Have you any grounds for supposing such a thing of him, Kraft? That's what I want to know. That's why I'm here. I believe everyone would do the same in his place. Would you behave so yourself? I'm not going to receive a fortune, so I can't tell about myself. Very well, I said, putting the letter in my pocket. The matter's settled for the present. Listen, Kraft. Maria Ivanovna, who has, I assure you, told me a great deal, said to me that you and only you could tell me the truth of what happened at Ems a year and a half ago between Versilov and Mademoiselle Almakov. 
I've been looking forward to seeing you as a sun that would throw light on everything. You don't know my position, Kraft. I beseech you to tell me the whole truth. What I want to know is what kind of man he is. And now, now I need to know it more than ever. I wonder Marie Ivanovna did not tell you about it herself. She might have heard it all from Andronikov, and of course she has heard it, and very likely knows more than I do. Andronikov was not clear about it himself, so Marie Ivanovna told me. It seems a maze to which no one has the clue. The devil himself would be lost in it. I know that you were at Ems yourself at the time. I never knew the whole of it, but what I do know, I will willingly tell you if you like, though I doubt whether I shall satisfy you. 2. I won't reproduce his story word for word, but will only give a brief summary of it. A year and a half before, Versilov, through the old prince, became a constant visitor at the Amakovs. They were all abroad then, at Ems, and made a great impression on the general himself, a man who had, during three years of marriage, squandered all his wife's large dowry over cards, and as a result of his irregular life had already had a paralytic stroke, though he was not an old man. He had recovered from it before going abroad, and was staying at Ems for the sake of his daughter by his first wife. She was a girl of seventeen, in delicate health, consumptive, and said to be extremely beautiful, but at the same time very fantastical. She had no dowry, but they rested their hopes, as usual, on the old prince. Mademoiselle Amakov was said to be a good stepmother, but the girl, for some reason, became particularly attached to Versilov. He was preaching at that time something impassioned, as Kraft expressed it, some sort of new life, was in a state of religious fervor of the most exalted kind, in the strange and perhaps ironical phrase of Andronikov, which was repeated to me. But it was noticeable that they all soon began to dislike him. The general was positively afraid of him. Kraft did not altogether deny the rumor that Versilov succeeded in instilling into the invalid husband's mind the suspicion that his wife, Katerina Nikolaevna, was not indifferent to the young Prince Sokolsky, who had left Ames and was at the time in Paris. He did this not directly, but after his usual fashion, by hints, inferences, and all sorts of roundabout ways, at which he is a great master, said Kraft. I may say that Kraft considered him, and preferred to consider him, altogether rather as an impostor and an inveterate intriguer than as a man genuinely possessed by some exalted, or at least original, idea. I knew, apart from Kraft, that Versilov, who had at first had an extraordinary influence on Katerina Nikolaevna, had by degrees come to an open rupture with her. What lay behind all this I could not find out from Kraft, but everyone confirmed the story of the mutual hatred that had sprung up between them after their friendship. Then came a strange circumstance. Katerina Nikolaevna's invalid stepdaughter apparently fell in love with Versilov, or was struck by something in him, or was inflamed by his eloquence, or I don't know what. But it is known that at one time Versilov spent almost every day at her side. It ended by the young lady suddenly announcing to her father that she wanted to marry Versilov. That this actually had happened was confirmed by everyone, by Kraft, by Andronikov, by Maria Ivanovna, and even Tatiana Pavlovna once spoke about it before me. They asserted also that Versilov not only desired it himself, but positively insisted on a marriage with this girl, and that these two creatures of such different species, one old and the other young, were in complete agreement about it. But the father was alarmed at the idea. As he became more estranged from Katerina Nikolaevna, whom he had been very fond of, he now began almost to idolize his daughter, especially after his stroke. But the bitterest opposition to the idea of such a marriage came from Katerina Nikolaevna. There followed a great number of secret and extremely unpleasant family wrangles, disputes, mortifying, and in fact revolting scenes. At last the father began to give way before the persistence of the lovesick girl who was, as Kraft expressed it, fanaticized by Versilov. But Katerina Nikolaevna still resisted it with implacable hatred. And it is at this stage that the muddle begins which no one can understand. But this was Kraft's conjecture based on the facts. Only a conjecture, however. He thought Versilov had succeeded in his characteristic way in subtly suggesting to the young person that the reason Katerina Nikolaevna would not agree was that she was in love with him herself and had been for a long time past worrying him with her jealousy, pursuing him and intriguing 
that she had declared her feeling to him and was now ready to horsewhip him for loving someone else, something of that sort anyway. Worst of all, that he had hinted this to the girl's father, the husband of the unfaithful wife, explaining that the prince had only been a passing amusement. The house, of course, began to be a perfect hell. In some versions of the story, Katerina Nikolaevna was devoted to her stepdaughter and now was in despair at being calumniated to her to say nothing of her relations with her invalid husband. And, what is more, there existed another version, which to my grief I found Kraft fully believed, and therefore I believed myself, of all this I had heard already. It was maintained, Andronikov, it was said, had heard it from Katerina Nikolaevna herself, that on the contrary, Versilov had in the past, before his feeling for the girl, made love to Katerina Nikolaevna, that though she had been his friend and had been for a time carried away by his religious exaltation, yet she had constantly opposed and mistrusted him, and that she had met Versilov's declaration with deep resentment and had ridiculed him vindictively, that she had formally dismissed him for having openly suggested that she should become his wife, as her husband was expected to have a second attack very shortly. On this theory, Katerina Nikolaevna must have felt a peculiar hatred for Versilov when she saw him afterwards so openly trying to win her stepdaughter's hand. Marie Ivanovna, who told me all this in Moscow, believed in both versions. Both together, that is. She maintained that there was nothing inconsistent in all this, that it was something in the style of la haine dans l'amour, of the wounded pride of love on both sides, etc., etc. Something, in fact, like a very subtle, intricate romance, quite out of keeping with any serious and common-sense man, and moreover with an element of nastiness in it. But Maria Ivanovna, in spite of her estimable character, had been from childhood upwards saturated with sentiment from the novels which she read day and night. The sequel exhibited Versilov's evident baseness, his lying and intriguing, something dark and loathsome in him, the more so as the affair had a tragic ending. The poor, infatuated girl poisoned herself, they say, by means of phosphorus matches, though even now I don't know whether to believe that last detail. They did their utmost to hush it up anyway. The young lady was ill for a fortnight and then died, so the matches remained an open question, but Kraft firmly believed in them. Shortly afterwards, the young lady's father died too, it was said from his grief, which brought on a second stroke, though this did not occur till three months later. But after the young lady's funeral, the young Prince Sokolsky, who had returned to Ems from Paris, gave Versilov a slap in the face in a public garden, and the latter had not replied with a challenge, but had, on the contrary, showed himself next day on the promenade as though nothing had happened. Then everyone turned against him, and Petersburg as well. Though Versilov kept up with some acquaintances, they were quite in a different circle. All his aristocratic friends blamed him, though as a fact scarcely anyone knew the details. They only knew something of the young lady's romantic death and the slap in the face. Only two or three persons knew the story fully, so far as that was possible. The one who had known most of all was the deceased Andronikov, who had for many years had business relations with the Amakovs, and had had to do with Katerina Nikolaevna particularly in one case. But he kept all these secrets even from his own family and had only told part of the story to Kraft and Marie Ivanovna, and that from necessity. The chief point is that there is a document in existence, concluded Kraft, which Mademoiselle Amakov is very much afraid of. And this was what he told me about that. When the old prince Katerina Nikolaevna's father was abroad, beginning to recover from his attack, she was so indiscreet as to write to Andronikov in dead secret, Katerina Nikolaevna put implicit faith in him, an extremely compromising letter. During his convalescence, the old prince actually did, it was said, display a propensity to waste his money, almost to fling it away, in fact. He began buying when he was abroad, quite useless but expensive objects, pictures, vases, making donations and subscriptions of large sums to various institutions out there, and goodness knows what. He almost bought on the sly for an immense sum a ruined and encumbered estate from a fashionable Russian spendthrift, and finally began even dreaming of matrimony. And in view of all this, Katerina Nikolaevna, who had never left her father's side during his illness, wrote to Andronikov as a lawyer and an old friend, inquiring whether it would be legally possible to put the old prince under guardianship or to declare him incompetent to manage his own affairs, and, if so, 
how it could best be done without a scandal, that no one might blame her and that her father's feelings might be spared, etc., etc. It was said that Andronikov advised her against this and dissuaded her, and later on, when the old prince had completely recovered, it was impossible to return to the idea, but the letter remained in Andronikov's hands, and now he had died, and Katerina Nikolaevna had at once remembered the letter. If it turned up among the deceased's papers and fell into the old prince's hands, he would no doubt have cast her off forever, cut her out of his will, and not given her another farthing during his lifetime. The thought that his own daughter did not believe in his sanity and even wanted to have him certified as a lunatic would change the lamb into a wild beast. Her husband's gambling habits had left her at his death without a farthing, and she had only her father to look to. She fully hoped to receive from him a second dowry as ample as the first. Kraft did not quite know what had become of the letter, but observed that Andronikov never tore up papers of consequence and he was besides a man of broad principles as well as broad intelligence. I was positively surprised at the independence of Kraft's criticism of Andronikov, whom he had loved and respected so much. But Kraft felt convinced that Versilov had obtained possession of the compromising document through his close relations with Andronikov's widow and daughters. It was known, indeed, that they had at once of necessity handed over all the deceased's papers to Versilov. He knew, too, that Katerina Nikolaevna was already aware that the letter was in Versilov's possession, and that she was frightened on account of it, imagining that Versilov would take the letter straight to her old father, that on her return from abroad she had searched for the document in Petersburg, had been at the Andronikovs, and was still hunting for it now, so that she must still have some hope that the letter was not in Versilov's hands, and finally that she had gone to Moscow simply with the same object, and had entreated Marie Ivanovna to look for it among the papers that had remained with her. She had only recently, since her return to Petersburg, heard of the existence of Marie Ivanovna, and of the footing on which the latter had stood with Andronikov. "'You don't think she found it at Marie Ivanovna's?' I asked. "'I have my own ideas. "'If Marie Ivanovna has not told even you about it, probably she hasn't got it. Then you suppose the document is in Versilov's hands? Most likely it is. I don't know, though. Anything is possible, he answered with evident weariness. I gave up questioning him, and indeed there was no object in doing so. All that mattered most had been made clear to me. In spite of all this sordid tangle, all that I feared most was confirmed. It's all like a delirious nightmare, I said, deeply dejected as I took up my hat. "'Is the man so dear to you?' asked Kraft. "'I read his deep sympathy on his face at that minute. "'I felt I shouldn't learn the whole story from you,' said I. "'Mademoiselle Amakov is the only hope left me. "'I was resting my hopes on her. "'Perhaps I shall go to her, and perhaps not.' "'Kraft looked at me with some surprise. "'Good-bye, Kraft,' I said. "'Why force oneself on people who don't want to see one? "'Isn't it better to break with everything, eh?' And what then, he asked almost sullenly, keeping his eyes on the ground. Retreat within oneself. Break with everything and withdraw within oneself. To America? To America. Within oneself. Simply within oneself. That's my whole idea, Kraft, I said enthusiastically. He looked at me with some curiosity. Have you such a place within yourself? Yes. Goodbye, Kraft. Thank you. I am sorry to have troubled you. If I were in your place and had that sort of Russia in my head, I'd send them all to hell. I'd say, get out with you. Keep your fretting and intriguing to yourselves. It's nothing to do with me. Stay a little longer, he said suddenly when he was already with me at the front door. I was a little surprised. I went back and sat down again. Kraft sat opposite. We looked at each other with a sort of smile. I can see it all now. I remember that I felt a sort of wonder at him. "'What I like in you is that you're so courteous,' I said suddenly. "'Yes?' "'I feel that because I don't often succeed in being courteous myself, though I should like to. "'And yet perhaps it's better for people to be rude to one. "'At least they save one from the misfortune of liking them.' "'What hour of the day do you like best?' he asked, evidently not listening to me. "'What hour? I don't know. I don't like sunset.' "'No?' he brought out with a peculiar curiosity. Are you going away again? Yes, I'm going away. 
Soon? Yes. Surely you don't want a revolver to get to Vilna, I asked without the faintest hidden meaning in my words, and indeed there was no meaning at all. I asked the question simply because I happened to glance at the revolver and I was at a loss for something to say. He turned and looked intently at the revolver. No, I take it simply from habit. If I had a revolver, I should keep it hidden somewhere, locked up. It really is a temptation, you know. I may not believe in an epidemic of suicide, but if it's always catching my eye, there really are moments, you know, when it might tempt one. Don't talk about it, he said, and suddenly got up from his chair. I wasn't thinking of myself, I said, standing up too. I'm not going to use it. If you were to give me three lives, it wouldn't be enough for me. Long life to you, broke from him. He gave me an absent-minded smile, and, strange to say, walked straight into the passage as though to show me out, probably not noticing what he was doing. I wish you every sort of success, Kraft, I said as I went out onto the stairs. That's as it may be, he answered firmly. Till we meet again. That's as it may be, too. I remember his last glance at me. Three. And this was the man for whom my heart had been beating all those years. And what had I expected from Kraft? What new information? As I came away from Kraft's, I felt very hungry. It was evening, and I had had no dinner. I went to a little restaurant in great prospect that I might not have to spend more than 20 or at most 25 kopecks. I would not have allowed myself to spend more at that time. I took some soup for myself, and as I ate it, I sat looking out of window. There were a great many people in the room, and there was a smell of burnt meat, restaurant napkins, and tobacco. It was nasty. Over my head, a dumb nightingale, gloomy and pensive, was pecking at the bottom of its cage. There was a noise in the adjoining billiard room, but I sat there and sank into deep thought. The setting sun, why was Kraft surprised at my not liking the sunset, aroused in me a new and unexpected sensation quite out of keeping with my surroundings. I was haunted by the soft look in my mother's eyes, her dear eyes which had been watching me so timidly the whole month. Of late I had been very rude at home, to her especially. I had a desire to be rude to Versilov, but not daring, in my contemptible way, tormented her instead. I had thoroughly frightened her, in fact. Often she looked at me with such imploring eyes when Andrei Petrovich came in, afraid of some outburst on my part. It was a very strange thing that, sitting here in the restaurant, I realized for the first time that while Verslov spoke to me familiarly, she always addressed me deferentially. I had wondered at it before and had not been impressed in her favor by it, but now I realized it particularly, and strange ideas passed one after another through my brain. I sat there a long time till it got quite dark. I thought about my sister, too. It was a fateful moment for me. At all costs, I must decide. Could I be incapable of decision? What is the difficulty of breaking with them if they don't want me either? My mother and sister? But I should not leave them anyway, however things turn out. It is true that the entrance of that man into my life, though only for an instance in my early childhood, was the turning point from which my conscious development began. Had he not met me then, my mind, my way of thinking, my fate would certainly have been different even in spite of the character ordained me by destiny, which I could not any way have escaped. But it turned out that this man was only a dream, the dream of my childhood. I had invented him myself, and in reality he was a different man who fell far below my imagination. I had come to find a genuine man, not a man like this. Why had I fallen in love with him once and forever in that brief moment when I saw him as a child? That forever must vanish." Sometime, if I have space for it, I will describe that meeting, the most futile incident leading up to nothing. But I had built it up into a pyramid. I had begun building that pyramid as I lay in my little bed. When falling asleep, I could dream and weep. What for, I cannot tell. Because I had been abandoned? Because I was tormented? But I was only tormented a little, and only for two years at Touchard's, the school into which he thrust me before leaving me forever. Afterwards, no one tormented me. Quite the contrary. I looked scornfully at my schoolfellows. And I can't endure the self-pity of the forlorn. There's no role more revolting than that of the orphan, the illegitimate, the outcast, and all such wretched creatures for whom I never feel any pity when they solemnly parade before the public and begin piteously but insistently whining of how they have been treated. 
I could beat them all. Will none of the filthy conventional herd understand that it would be ten times as credible to hold their tongues, not to whine and not to deign to complain? And if he does deign, he deserves his fate, the bastard. That's my view. But what is absurd is not that I used to dream of him in my little bed, but that almost forgetting my chief object, I have come here for the sake of him, of that imagined man. I have come to help him to stamp out a calumny, to crush his enemies. The document of which Kraft had spoken, that woman's letter to Andronikov about which she was so afraid, which might ruin her and reduce her to poverty, which she supposed to be in Versilov's hands, was not in his possession, but in mine, sewn up in my coat pocket. I had sewn it there myself, and no one in the whole world knew of it. The fact that the romantic Marie Ivanovna, in whose keeping the letter was left to be preserved, thought fit to give it to me and to no one else was only her own idea and a matter for her to decide, which I am not called upon to explain, though I may discuss it later if it seems appropriate. But, armed with this unexpected weapon, I could not help yielding to the temptation to come to Petersburg. Of course, I proposed to assist this man secretly without display or excitement, without expecting his praise or his embraces, and never, never would I condescend to reproach him for anything. And indeed, was it his fault that I had fallen in love with him and had created a fantastic ideal of him? Though indeed I did not perhaps love him at all. His original mind, his interesting character, his intrigues and adventures, and what my mother had been to him, all that, it seemed, could not keep me. It was enough that my fantastic doll was shattered, and that I could not perhaps love him any more. And so what was keeping me? Why was I sticking there? That was the question. The upshot of it all was that only I was a fool, no one else. But expecting honesty from others, I will be honest myself. I must confess that the letter sewn up in my pocket did not only arouse in me the passionate desire to rush to Versilov's aid. Now it is quite clear to me, and even then I thought of it with a blush. I had visions of a woman, a proud aristocratic creature, whom I should meet face to face. She would laugh at me, despise me as though I were a mouse. She would not even suspect that her future was in my power. This idea intoxicated me even in Moscow and still more in the train on the way. I have confessed this already. Yes, I hated that woman, but already I loved her as my victim, and all this was true, all this was real. But this was childishness, which I should not have expected even from anyone like me. I am describing my feelings then, that is, what passed through my mind as I sat in the restaurant under the nightingale and made up my mind to break with them forever. The memory of my recent meeting with that woman sent a rush of color to my face, an ignominious meeting, an ignominious and stupid impression, and what mattered most, it showed my incapacity for action. It proved, I thought then, that I was not strong enough to withstand the stupidest lure, though I told Kraft myself just now that I had my place within myself and work of my own, and that if I had three lives, they wouldn't be enough for me. I said that proudly. My having abandoned my idea and mixed myself up with Versilov's affairs was to some extent excusable, but that I should run from side to side like a frightened hare and be drawn into every trifle, that of course was simply my own folly. What induced me to go to Dergachev's and to burst out with my imbecilities, though I knew long ago that I am incapable of saying anything cleverly or sensibly, that it is always better for me to be silent? and some Vassin or other reassures me with the reflection that I have fifty years of life ahead of me, and so I have no need to worry. It was a good reply, I admit, and did credit to his unmistakable intelligence. It was good because it was the simplest, and what is simplest is never understood till the last, when everything that is cleverer or stupider has been tried already. But I knew that answer before Vassin, I'd had an inkling of that thought more than three years ago. What's more, my idea was to some extent included in it. Such were my reflections in the restaurant. I felt disgusted as I made my way towards Semyonovsky Polk at eight o'clock in the evening, worn out with walking and with thinking. It was quite dark by then, and the weather had changed. It was dry, but a horrid Petersburg wind had sprung up, blowing keenly and malignantly on my back and whirling up the dust and sand. 
How many sullen faces of poor people hurrying home to their corners from work and trade. Every one had his own sullen anxiety in his face, and there was perhaps not one common uniting thought in the crowd. Kraft was right. Everyone was different. I met a little boy, so little that it was strange he could be out alone in the street at that hour. He seemed to have lost his way. A peasant woman stopped for a minute to listen to him, but not understanding what he said, waved her hand and went on, leaving him alone in the darkness. I was going towards him, but he suddenly took fright and ran away. As I approached the house, I made up my mind that I should never go and see Vassine. I had an intense longing as I went up the stairs to find them at home alone, without Versilov that I might have time before he came in to say something nice to my mother or to my dear sister, to whom I had scarcely said anything particular all that month. It so happened that he was not at home. 4. By the way, as I am bringing onto the scene this new character, I am speaking of Versilov, I will introduce briefly a formal account of him, though it is of no significance. I do this to make things more comprehensible for the reader, and because I can't foresee where this account could fit in in the later part of my story. He studied at the university, but went into a cavalry regiment of the guards. He married Mademoiselle Fenariatov and retired from the army. He went abroad, and on his return lived a life of worldly gaiety in Moscow. On his wife's death, he spent some time in the country. Then came the episode with my mother. Then he lived for a long time somewhere in the south. During the war with Europe, he served in the army but did not reach the Crimea and was never in action. At the conclusion of the war, he left the service and went abroad. He took my mother with him, though he left her at Konigsberg. The poor woman used sometimes shaking her head to tell with a sort of horror how she had spent six months there with her little girl, not knowing the language, absolutely friendless, and in the end penniless, as though she were lost in a forest. Then Tatiana Pavlovna came to fetch her and took her back to some place in the Novgorod province. Then, on the emancipation of the serfs, Versilov became one of the first mediators and is said to have performed his duties admirably, but he soon gave this up, and in Petersburg was occupied with the conduct of various private lawsuits. Andronikov always had a high opinion of his capacity. He had a great respect for him and only said he did not understand his character. Then Versilov gave that up too and went abroad again, this time for a long period, several years. Then came his close intimacy with old Prince Sokolsky. During this period, his financial position underwent two or three radical changes. At one time he fell into complete poverty, then grew wealthy and rose again. Having brought my story to this point, I am determined to describe my idea too. For the first time since its conception, I will translate it into words. I am determined to reveal it, so to speak, to the reader partly for the sake of greater clearness in what I have to explain further. And it is not only confusing for the reader, even I, the author, am beginning to get muddled by the difficulty of explaining each step without explaining what led up to it and induced me to take it. By keeping up this attitude of silence, I have clumsily descended to one of those literary graces which I have ridiculed above. Before entering upon my Petersburg romance with all my ignominious adventures in it, I find this preface is necessary, but I was not tempted to silence for the sake of literary grace, but was forced to it by the nature of the case, that is, the difficulty of the case. Even now, when it is all over, I find it very difficult to put this idea into words. Besides, I must describe it in its aspects at that time, that is, the form it took and the way I looked at it. Not now, but then, and that is a fresh difficulty. To describe some things is almost impossible. The ideas that are the simplest and the clearest are the most difficult to understand. If, before the discovery of America, Columbus had begun telling his idea to other people, I am convinced that for a very long time people would not have understood him. And indeed, they did not understand him. I don't mean to compare myself with Columbus, and if anyone imagines that I do, he ought to be ashamed of himself. That's all. End of part one, chapter four, read by Josh Stevens and Ashland, Oregon.